Hello everyone and welcome to Study IQ. I'm Dr. Mahipal Rathod and today we have with us a very special guest. It is none other than the famous historian and biographer of Mr. Mahatma of Mahatma Gandhi ji, Mr. Ram Chandra Guha. Uh, Professor Ram Chandra Guha is uh, one of the most noted historians of modern India and he has also written many books on cricket and environmental uh, issues and he is a prolific writer he keeps on writing many essays and for upsc aspirants out there or everyone watching this i'm sure uh, you would recognize him because you must have read his book and so today i'm going to ask him some questions but before that so welcome to study iq thank you maipal thank you so uh, so i would begin uh, a few questions with your book about mahatma gandhi you have been his biographer you have written many books on him but uh, one of the books that india after gandhi which almost all the upsc aspirants read so there's a question uh, from that book you have said that if nehru was the maker of modern india then uh, perhaps potty shri ramulu should be named its mercator now linguistic reorganization which took place within the first 10 years of india's independence how do you think it shaped india in its formative years yeah so uh, first of all uh, the commitment uh, to make states based on language was made by mahatma gandhi and the indian national congress as early as 1920 well before independence uh, however uh, when india became independent it was partitioned on the basis of religion so the rulers at that time were nervous and they deferred the question of formation of linguistic states which is why potty sri ramulu had to go on that famous fast unto death now i believe that the creation of states on the basis of language was very important at that stage because that promise had been given in the 1920s and because india is a, a nation of many languages and many great classical languages tamil is arguably older than sanskrit kannada or languages like kannada odia telugu are much older than hindi for example so there are great literatures going back hundreds of years in some case thousands of years and every language is the source of great pride and identity among the people of that region so the states were formed and i think this is a very wise because it saved india from going down the route of pakistan and sri lanka pakistan was created on the basis of religion people of west pakistan and east pakistan were promised that their religion would be safe but jinnah insisted on one language so when he went on his first trip as governor general of pakistan to east pakistan what was that east pakistan in dhaka he told the bengalis of the east that all of you have to learn urdu and that sowed the seeds of separation that led many years later to the creation of bangladesh in sri lanka you had two major languages sinhala which was spoken in the south and tamil that was spoken in the north the sinhala were a majority so they tried to impose their language on the tamils and this led to a civil war in which tens of thousands of people were killed and we were very fortunate we did not go down that route there was a mistaken attempt in 1965 to impose hindi on south india that was pushed back uh, by the tamil protesters and then shastri who was prime minister wisely withdrew and apologized for imposing hindi and it's very dangerous that there are still some people in north india who think that hindi must be imposed to the whole of the country the reason we are one and not divided like pakistan the reason we not had a civil war based on language unlike sri lanka is because of the creation of linguistic states i'll say one last thing and i think this is very important for uh, all, all all your young viewers and listeners to recognize a nation is evolving in the 1950s we needed linguistic states and there was a states reorganization commission that mandated the creation of these states in 2004 when the upa came to power they promised a second states reorganization commission unfortunately the upa did not honor that promise i believe it's very important for us to go in for a fresh reorganization of states i mean we andhra pradesh was broken up into two states telangana and andhra but there's no reason why maharashtra should not be two states uh, maybe other certainly uttar pradesh is too large to be run as one state you know uttar pradesh should be at least four states it will be much more manageable in my view Uttar Pradesh stands not for Uttar UP stands not for Uttar Pradesh but ungovernable Pradesh. It doesn't matter whether BJP is in power or Samajwadi Party is in power or Bahujan Samajwadi is in power. Party is in power. UP is too large to be run as a single state. So we need a second states reorganization commission. The USA, which has a population less than half of ours, has fifty states. 
and we only have i think now 20 after uh, the, uh, the diminution of kashmir 28 so i think we need the first the first test of organization commission was based on language the second one must be based on size and feasibility uttarakhand i am a native of uttarakhand by the way i am a native of uttarakhand uttarakhand is much better off for having broken off from up chatisgarh has done much better after it broke off from np we need smaller states and we need i I'm sad that Dr. Manmohan Singh and the UPA did not honor their promise. Maybe a new government somewhere will, but we need a second state reorganization commission for better governance. Okay. So uh, this question is even related to the new education policy right now, and even the earlier education policies, where language was again a very debatable issue. As you pointed out in 1960s, there was some attempt to uh, impose uh, as such Hindi all over the India. So, do you think that this new reorganization that uh, you are hinting at, or you think which is necessary, this will solve the problem of the education policies, multilingualism? No, I think multilingual. All Indians are multilingual, and we must encourage this. You know, between the different languages of India, there are two linked languages: Hindi and English. When you are talking about scientific discussion and intellectual debate, it could be English. When it's popular conversation, it could be Hindi. If you do not impose Hindi, it will spread. Uh, you know, through the medium of the film, through popular culture, it will spread. So this must be organic. It must not be imposed. You know, uh, and every Indian is multilingual. Every Indian speaks several languages, so that must be encouraged. Now, one of the problems what happened in 19, the 1960s is the three language policy was introduced, and South Indians had to learn Hindi, but North Indians did not learn Tamil or Kannada. They use Sanskrit as their third language. So Hindi and Sanskrit are very closely allied. So we must promote multilingualism. And uh, I believe it's very important to retain this anti-English phobia that is current among some sections of the political class is deeply unfortunate. When in the 1950s, Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia said, in Angrezi, he started an Angrezi Hatao campaign. The great scholar Chakravarti Rajagopalachari, a great scholar of our classical literature said, if Saraswati is the goddess of language, she also gave birth to English, so English is an Indian language too. So I think that kind of large-hearted spirit must be maintained. English and Hindi can both be linked languages, but neither of them should be imposed. So you have uh, written in your book uh, a line which uh, profoundly impacted me. In the post-Gandhian war for power, the first casualty is decency. Now we have all seen that the uh, civility of public debate is going down everywhere, be it media or even public life. Do you think that social media is amplifying this problem? And what is your solution to this uh, problem where we are not very courteous to each other while debating even the mundane of things? No, it is social media is certainly amplifying it. And also it's a global issue. You know, the most uncivil politician alive today is the most powerful man in the world, the president of the United States of America. Uh, uh, the language used by him is unforgivable and it demeans his office it demeans his country you know the kind of language he uses about his opponent uh, jo joe biden or about other people about women so i think you know there is a urdu word or a hindustani word which you will be very familiar with my pal called tamiz that's why i said but tamiz without tamiz a person without tamiz uh, who has no civility i think civility in language is as important you must be non-violent in deed and in language so never impute personal motives. You can say, so for example, I believe uh, that Rahul Gandhi was profoundly mistaken uh, in the last election in coining the slogan, Chauki Dar Chor Hai. Because that is personal language that demeans the office of the Prime Minister. You can say, have an inquiry into the Rafael deal. Uh, let the Lok Sabha CAG inquire into it. But to say, Chauki Dar Chor Hai is cheapening this cause. Or, uh, for Mr. Narendra Modi to say about Rahul Gandhi ki wo shahzada hai, that is also cheaper in discourse. So attack, disagree, uh, debate policies, but never be personal. You know, uh, again, if I may give you an American example. Earlier this year, a very great American politician, Congressman John Lewis died, who was a hero of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. He had worked with Dr. Martin Luther King. He was a great friend of India. He had visited Sabarmati Ashram, his great man Mahatma Gandhi. And he had a wonderful phrase. He said, we must disagree without being disagreeable. We must, we must disagree without being disagreeable. If I was to try and say it uh, in Hindi, 
हम बहस कर सकते हैं हमारे बीच मतभेद हो सकती है लेकिन तभी इसके साथ बहस करेंगे आदर के साथ बहस करेंगे आई थिंक इफ वी के मस्ट डिसग्री बट विदाउट बी डिसग्रीएबल दैट्स अ वे वी कैन बिल्ड अ कंस्ट्रक्टिव पॉलिसी and i think all sides are responsible uh, in the deepening cheapening of the debate there is no one party no one politician who was primarily responsible as i said uh, it's a global phenomenon but ordinary indians must ask for tamiz from their leaders okay vajpay had it vajpay had tamiz totally you know uh, jawaharlal nehru had it he never talked to call people names so there have been many examples in the past uh, uh, jaswant singh who died yesterday was a senior leader he would never use vulgar abuse for people to disagree he would say your policy is wrong he would say the congress policy for abc the reasons but just one thing would never use the kind of language that our current politicians use so i think tamiz is very very important in politics and in everyday life i mean how friends talk to each other how you talk to family members you must have some courtesy and civility you think that politicians changing uh, their ways would trickle down to the uh, society of at large it would it would but also bhai pal we must demand this of our politician we must not laugh when politician a mocks politician b you should say if politician a makes a good arg political argument yes but when they are called names i think it's inappropriate so uh, you have quoted justice y b chandrachud in your book and uh, he says a common civil code will help the cause of national integration by removing disparate loyalties to laws which have conflicting ideologies now in theory this seems a uh, very good that we should have a uniform civil code but on the other hand we have constitutional protections constitutional uh, safeguards for the minorities and for uh, laws personal laws for them so don't you think that uh, there is a, a contradiction here in the constitution itself and uh, how this could be resolved yeah so i am not a constitutional scholar uh, so it is true that you know it's a very long constitution uh, it has many uh, different articles they can be uh, interpreted against each other you know uh, but i believe that a common civil code on matters of marriage divorce family must be framed i think it's a mistake uh, uh, i i you know uh, i by the way i don't believe that the current government has been in power six years it's not committed to it it says about it because it wants to hold it as a sword against over the muslims the congress opposes it because it thinks the bjp supports it no one has argued from first principle Goa is a state in India which has a common civil code. Bangladesh has elements, and Sri Lanka have elements of a common civil code. So I believe some things. So women and a common civil code, Ma Mahipal, must be based on two principles: individual rights, the freedom of the individual to marry, divorce, and on gender equality. Daughters must not be discriminated against. Wives and daughters must not be discriminated against. We have so many great lawyers. you don't have to you know there's a worry that a common civil code will use a lot of hindu elements i these are all uh, unnecessary worries get great lawyers on the basis of individual freedoms and gender equality uh construct a common civil code you can still have your temples and your mosques and worship there wherever you want but it wait when it comes to things like marriage and property i think there must be a common civil code so you have called india a 50 50 democracy uh, at a few instances can you elaborate on that why do you call india a 50 50 democracy well i mean so what i mean by that mahipal is that it's an imperfect democracy you know obviously it is a democracy it has regular elections that are relatively free and fair it has a press that is not completely free but not is completely controlled either we have freedom of movement for example in china which is an authoritarian country i can't go from beijing to shanghai and change my jobs without getting a, a you know a, a state permit but our institutions the institutions of democracy are not as robust as in more mature democracies such as like canada or sweden and so on so we are imperfect democracy i believe i called india 50 50 democracy in my book written in 2007 i think we are probably closer to a 30 70 democracy now i think we have declined in many ways but we could again improve we could become a better democracy democracies are work in progress uh uh you know and they will always be faults and failures but we must recognize them and seek to improve at the functioning of our institutions so that we become a better democracy okay for example i mean i i take the example of the media now again this is very contemporary look at the story run on um, on president trump's uh, tax returns by the new york times yesterday now 
it's inconceivable that the any indian media would do a story of this kind because for whatever reason partly they are scared partly they are worried that the enforcement directorate will come after them there will be vendetta by the political class again this is regardless of political party when the congress was in power uh, they launched a witch hunt against newspapers that attacked them yesterday in chatisgarh the congress government attacked allowed the attack of a journalist who was opposed to that right so that's why as uh, the, the bjp of course does it all the time in delhi so uh, it we are an imperfect democracy because our press our courts our public institutions are not completely free and autonomous but at the same time we have regular elections we have freedom of movement which why the 50 50 is just a it's a line borrowed from johnny walker the filmmaker you know uh, it's kind of a it's a kind of a metaphor for the fact that we are not an authoritarian state like china nor are we a totally admirable democracy like the scandinavian countries we are somewhere in between okay. so uh, you have written a lot about cricket in india and it also its history so i was just fascinated by the fact that cricket initially started as a game of elites then it became the game of the common man and since the 80s we have seen complete transition of cricket and its role in indian society do you think that in the future cricket will play a role in national integration and in the overall nationalistic feelings that we are seeing around us so first of all i'll talk about the democratization of cricket you know uh, mahipal i'm a historian as a historian i have documented many epochal historical moments so for example two of the chapters in india after gandhi are about two great events in our modern history the framing of the constitution and the first general election right now in writing the biography of mahatma gandhi i have had to document many extraordinary historical events such as the salt march uh, his uh, fast in pune in 1932 and so on and so forth but as a citizen i have only once watched history in make in history in the making and that was to do with cricket when i was a boy of 16 in 1974 that's 46 years ago i with my own eyes in uh, the city where i'm speaking to you now bangalore watched karnataka beat bombay in the semi finals of the ranji trophy at that stage 1974 bombay had been undefeated for 16 years but before i was born bombay was champion until then i had not no one uh, for 16 years karnataka's defeat of bombay in 1974 was very important for the democratization of indian cricket because after karnataka won the ranji trophy then delhi won tamil nadu won hyderabad won uh, you know bengal won uh, madhya pradesh won and so on and so forth right and gujarat won uh, you know uh, saurashtra won and this led to talent from everywhere in 1971 when uh, the indian cricket team toured england seven out of the 11 players were six out of the 11 players were from mumbai now and i believe that that i watched history in the making because the victory of karnataka showed that other parts of india could be as good and the game spread everywhere and then when television came television took the game everywhere so that's why you had a dhoni from jharkhand uh, coming up or a kapil dev from haryana before so i think the extraordinary thing about indian cricket is the geographical spread which wasn't there before in, in the indian teams of the 50s and 60s it was only the metros There were seven players out of eleven from Bombay, one from Bangalore, one from Madras, one from Calcutta. That's it, right? So this kind of democratization is very, very uh, important, and the game is also the spectatorship has also become democratic. You know, it's one of the amazing things in my lifetime. I mean, you are, you know, uh, very young, but when I was growing up, the audiences at cricket matches were ninety-five percent male, maybe ninety-eight percent male. now they'll be closer to 60 40 or maybe even 50 50 i mean i'm sure you know your sisters and your 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 mothers and your female cousins also follow the game so uh, uh where i was growing up cricket was mostly followed in the cities and small towns not in the countryside and in the villages now it's followed there too so it's become a completely all india game is democratized i don't at the same time uh, you know uh uh Uh, it it can it has it is sometimes productive a very ugly kind of nationalism when we play pakistan for example you know a lot of ugly feelings come out but it's become much less of an elite sport over the last 40 years and what i call the decentering or the decentralization of indian cricket began when karnataka beat mumbai in 1974 which i watched so that's when i saw history in the making in a cricketing sense not in a political sense 
So uh, my next question is regarding uh, the historians chronicling the role of women in India's freedom struggle. Now, uh, I'm not accusing historians of anything, but uh, when we read the books, we mostly read about the contribution of men. But on the other hand, right. we have instances like Sarojini Naidu becoming the president of uh, Congress in 1925, I think. And at that yeah. point, I don't think anywhere in the world, the major political parties were being led by women. In fact, the suffrage movement was uh, just going on in England uh, parallelly. So why do you think this, uh, the, the women's contribution has been largely ignored or it has been given a very little place by historians? So I'll come to that in a minute, but, but it's very important. I talked about cricket and moving away from the metros. Yeah. Uh, history has been biased towards men, towards powerful men and towards upper caste men. So Dalits and Adivasis have figured much less in our history than Savarna Hindus or even sometimes Ashraf Muslims. So, you know, you have uh, elite Muslims like the Mughals written about, but Dalits and Adivasis have been ignored as much as women. And I think over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a concerted attempt by younger historians to bring what they call subaltern groups, previously explored, oppressed, underprivileged groups into historical narrative. Uh, politics was for a long time a male activity because women were restricted to the home. Uh, Sarojini Naidu, who was educated, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, who came later, and was an extraordinary person, in my view, probably the greatest Indian woman ever, in the last 200 years, greater than Indira Gandhi, amazing person. You know, Kamala Devi, more or less, forced Gandhi to allow women to uh, court arrest during the salt mart. 42 movement were women. But we are an extremely patriarchal society, and we remain one. So women, and women's place is supposed to be the home, but I think now there's more, more effort coming in. I mentioned the Constituent Assembly of India. And there were some women who played a very important role in that. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, Hansa Mehta, Renuka Ray. If there's a young historian watching this program, I'd say there's a great book to be written on uh, the female members of the Constituent Assembly of India. There was a, someone from UP called Begum Azizul Rasul who made some of the best speeches, uh, most uh, eloquent speeches in the Constituent Assembly. So I think it's it's... Women have been excluded from historical narratives. So have Dalits and Adivasis. And it's the job of historians to bring the, because they don't leave written records. I mean, the, the records are written, written, uh, mostly by educated elite men who leave the records. So Gandhi, 90 volumes of Gandhi's collected works. But some female Satyagrahi in Orissa who joined the 42 movement won't have that left behind those records. So it's much more difficult to write about them. But one yet, one must yet do whatever one can to search the traces of the historical record for the voices, the deeds, the activities, the thoughts of uh, excluded and disadvantaged groups like women, Adivasis and Dalits. Okay. So uh, you have written that it is in the nature of democracies, perhaps that while visionaries are sometimes necessary to make them, once made, they can be managed by mediocrities. So my question is in this context, how long such mediocrities can hold the port? Uh, given the diversity of India. Yeah, I think now, uh, I mean, and also may, you may go worse than mediocrities. So, you know, uh, you may go to people who are either incompetent or malign or sectarian or extremely megalomaniac or, who put, or, or, or too weak. So I think now we, we have, I mean, I wrote that in 2007. I mean, my book was published in 2007. So I probably wrote that in 2005, 2006. In the last 15 years, I think, I mean, this is for future historians to talk about, right? I had to document. But in my views, in different in my view, in different ways, the second term of Manmohan Singh and the second term of Narendra Modi will be judged very harshly by historians. That's my view. It's a little premature, but I still feel that if you know in 2005, 6, 2007, when we when we in 2007, when we marked the 60th anniversary of our independence. People were talking of India and China as rising past together. Now, no one talks like that, you know, and this is before COVID. The slide of India, the decline of India started before COVID. And maybe, you know, there's something has, uh, you know, uh, it's partly the quality of the leadership, but we must not always only blame the leader. You know, maybe there were faults in our, in our institutions, in the way Indians dealt with each other. But I believe the, the last 15 years, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the institutions of Indian democracy have eroded and our economic potential. You know, one of the great uh, <coughs> spin-offs of economic liberalization. You are a child of economic liberalization. How, how old are you, Vaibha? I'm 30. 
Okay, so you were born after just a, just a year before the economy was liberalized. I am exactly a little more than twice your age. So I've seen India in before and after. What economic liberalization did was unleash the entrepreneurial and technological and innovative potential. And it lifted hundreds of millions of Indians out of poverty. And now they're going to go back into poverty and joblessness. Uh, so at the same time, as you pointed out in the earlier question, we have become a much more violent society in how we speak and deal with each other. You know, our, um, our press has become timid. So we have to ponder carefully on where we lost our way and what is the role of uh, incompetent or malign leaders of all political parties in making us lose our way. And that's, of course, a question future historians will answer, but that we have lost our way and we seem not to be fulfilling the potential we had 10 or 15 years ago, I think it's evident to everyone. It's certainly evident to the world, even okay. if it's not evident to us. I would just like to add here that Dr. Manmohan Singh often says that history will be kinder to him while uh, judging his second term or even the first term. I don't think so. I think his first term, yes, but I think his second, the mistake, the split, the, st the mistake started in his second term. I wrote a column, I mean, as I said, I, I want to keep this largely to history. I wrote a column in the NDTV, which is published, called uh, Our Strong Prime Minister's Good for India, which came about two weeks, two or three weeks ago. And I said, Manmohan Singh was too weak in his second term and Narendra Modi uh, is too strong. Narendra Modi does not empower his cabinet ministers enough. And Manmohan Singh let, uh, you know, uh, his cabinet ministers do whatever they wanted. So I think the slide started in Manmohan Singh's second term and has continued and we must, because I think we are somewhere losing our way. And I feel particularly because uh, you know, uh, 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 people of your generation who are beneficia beneficiaries of an outward looking liberal India, what will happen if we close into ourselves and lose our potential? It will be the young people who will be suffering. But my life is more or less over. I mean, I don't have longer on this planet or in this country very much. It's really future generations who will have to bear the brunt of our mistakes in the present. So, in your uh, collection of essays, patriots and partisans, you have outlined three challenges to uh, Indian democracy. First is Hindu fundamentalism. Second is communist dicta dictatorship. And third is ethnic separatism. And uh, it is said that none of these are new to our age. You mentioned that they were uh, as much there in 1947 as they are today. So how does one imagine a counter to the uh, challenges in today's day and age in 2020 or this eighth decade of our independence? I think of those three challenges, one has declined. Communism, dicta communist dictatorship. You know, I was never a sympathizer of communism over violence. Uh, although I have written extensively on the suffering of Adivasis in uh, the Central Indian Belt, I never remotely endorsed what the Naxalites were doing. I think they are brutal and barbaric in their means. So that has declined. But Hindu fundamentalism has increased and ethnic separatism has also possibly increased. You know, we should worry about what's happening in, um, in Kashmir. I mean, our government should be sensitive to what the new farm bills are doing to the farmers of the Punjab. It's a border state. Kashmir is already already troubled. Do you want Punjab, Nagaland? There's been no resolution of the peace uh, process there, right? So I think uh, then there are other challenges. I think I would like to highlight two in particular. What is the decline of institutions? You know, 20, 30 years ago, our universities were some of them were world class. Our universities are declined. Uh, and environmental degradation may be the greatest challenge we face. You know, the fact that our rivers are biologically dead, uh, very high rates of air pollution, the climate change question. So these are all important issues that confront us that require a long term perspective beyond winning the next state election. You know, our media is so obsessed with the next state election, Bihar, then Bengal, that the slow evolution, organic evolution of our country is completely uh, not given the kind of importance it deserves. And uh, so since you have mentioned environmental uh, issues, uh, I must inform our viewers because many of you know you, know you as just a historian, but uh, yes. Professor Guha has written extensively on environment issues as well. And I think one of your earliest books uh, were on environmental issues. And uh, regarding this, I have a question for you. So do you think that the multilateral organizations today are not strong enough to tackle the environmental challenge we have in front of us? Because uh, we so, see the, yeah. all, those, all those treaties, Absolutely. they are, they are, yeah. They are, they are. The short answer is yes. Uh, but the, the longer answer. The longer answer is the environmental challenge is local, national and global. So the local challenge is, 
I live in Bangalore. There are no water sources around Bangalore. We get our water, we first got our water from a lake, uh, uh, a reservoir called Tipagonda Hali, which is 20 or 30 miles away. Then our city grew, we needed more water, we went to the Kaveri, which is 60 or 70 miles away. Now we want to go to the Sharavati River, which is 300 miles away. How can we sustain that? So we have to manage, Bangalore has to manage its water much more wisely. Delhi has to manage its pollution much more wisely, so that so, so many young people don't die uh, because of you know respiratory disorders. So it's a local problem, it's also a national problem. You know, if we excessively pollute our soils, our farmers will not be able to practice sustainable agriculture. And there's the global challenge of climate change. So you need robust institutions that promote sustainable thinking in the environment uh, at every level, the city, the state, the region, the country and the globe. And I think we have to, as Indians, you know, there's a, there's a famous environmental saying, Maxim, think globally, act locally. So while being worried about climate change, we must also at the same time be equally concerned about the state of the air and water in our own basti. Right. So I think this is very important not to uh, lose sight of the different levels at which you need wise environmental governance, not only at the level of the globe, but at all the lower levels as well. So uh, there was a question uh, which I forgot to ask you when I uh, asked you about the 50-50 democracy uh, issue. Uh, there was the first amendment which was brought in uh, right when uh, yes. we got independence yes. and uh, our parliament started functioning. At that time, yes. even Jawaharlal Nehru, he who was uh, one of the liberals, uh, so as uh, what they call them today, even he supported that first amendment, which put a lot yes. of restrictions on the freedom of speech. Even Ambedkar yes. supported yes. that. So, uh, do you think that uh, this trend is just continuing, and it is nothing new that uh, every government tries to just muzzle the freedom of speech? So, absolutely, yes. So, I think. The first amendment was a mistake. Nehru was prime minister. Patel was home minister. Patel also supported it. Uh, Ambedkar was law minister. So the three giants of the government, Nehru as prime minister, Patel as home minister, and Ambedkar as law minister all supported it. Because they were nervous just after partition that the country would break up, there would be all kind of anarchy and spread of hatred and kind of what we now call uh, fake news. Right. Now, it was a mistake. I have written about it in one of my essays, you can Google it online, it's called Eight Threats to Freedom and Expression. And even if it was necessary in 1950, by 1955, when the country was stable, it was not breaking apart, there was no secession threat, Nehru should have dismantled it. And that he did not do it, but not in subsequent governments. You know, Indira Gandhi could have done it, Vajpayee could have done it, Modi could have done it, but once a restriction is there, every politician wants it to keep people in check. You know, if you look at UIPA today, which is being grossly abused, it was came with the Congress government that this government has strengthened it. But it's the job of the courts to be much more vigilant and direct. You know, I think the courts have been succumbed to the pressure of the executive on questions like freedom of speech, habeas corpus, corpus, detention without bail. All these legislations, the First Amendment till the UPA, disfigure India and weaken our democratic credentials. And politicians, unfortunately, want to keep a check on us, want to keep a curb on us, and regardless of parties. I mean, there's a lot of debate now on the UIPA, and I believe it's an obnoxious legislation. The UIPA is worse than any colonial era legislation. Under the UIPA, uh, Gandhi would have been in jail. Ambedkar would have been in jail. But it was brought in by the Congress, and the BJP uh, made it, uh, strengthened it. But uh, so this is a kind of very worrisome situation. And that's why I say we are probably not a 50-50 democracy, but 40-60 or 30-70 now. So I hold Nehru, Patel and Ambedkar guilty of bringing the First Amendment. I hold Nehru even more guilty for not undoing it in the, the subsequent decade when he was in power. And we did not need the First Amendment at all. And certainly I hold all subsequent prime ministers guilty as well. Uh so if you think that Mahatma Gandhi would have been alive today, as you just mentioned that he would have been in jail uh, under UAPA, but let's say he, he would not be in jail, then what would he be doing right now? Uh, would he be happy with the state of affairs in the country? Or do you think he would be sitting against the government in a protest? What would so be the thought of Mahatma I, Gandhi right now? So I think there are three or four timeless questions he raised, uh, which he would be talking about. Four or five maybe. What is Hindu-Muslim harmony? You know, I think Gandhi would be very worried that we are becoming a Hindu Pakistan. In Pakistan, uh, there's a majoritarian tendency. 
uh, in Burma, there's a majority in terms. It's a Buddhist state, and non-Buddhists are persecuted and harassed. He would not be one be, be asked to be a country where Hindus dominate everything, and he would resist that. He would also urgently focus attention on the question of gender equality. You mentioned Sarojini Naidu. It was Gandhi who was instrumental in making Sarojini Naidu president of the Congress Party on the violation of rights of women. You talked about that. Uh, he would have spoken about our environmental predicament because he had warned almost 90 years ago about the destructive energy and resource intensive path of Western industrialization. He said, if India follows that path, we will strip the world bare like locusts. I mean, he was an early environmental prophet. He would have talked about civility and courtesy in public life. And he would have, uh, he'd been absolutely fearless. I think, so what he would have done, would he have joined a party? Would he have been on dharna? I cannot say. But the values he stood for, interfaith harmony, equality uh, uh, for all people, regardless of caste or gender, uh, environmental responsibility, civility and courtesy, tamiz in public life. These are the values you would have fought for and struggled for. In what way, we can't say. So my next question to you is uh, directed as a historian, although you are writing about modern India and history, but uh, as a historian, what do you think about this vantage point issue? For example, right now, uh, we know everything about the India's history till, till past five, 6,000 years. But two centuries ago, the Ashokan edicts, we did not know about them. About 120 years ago, we did not know about the Indus Valley civilization. So uh, uh, as a historian, how do you think that this uh, knowledge of that that we do not have access to certain resources right now, which may uncover new facts. Uh, how does it change the way you write history? Are you historians well, uh, aware about the process or uh, you yeah. try to ignore every, it? Every historian, every historian must understand that he or she does the job to the best of their abilities based on the documentary evidence, the non-documentary evidence, your own skills of research, your own paths of analysis, you write a book. Someone will come 10 years later and write a better book, a more deeper research book, a more thoughtful book. New evidence will come, new perspective will come. Uh, there's a great Dutch historian called Peter Gale. He said, history is an argument without end. So history is continuous. History is not, but history is not perfect truth, but it's not untruth either. I mean, there is some protocol by which you judge facts, assess them, sift them, analyze them. Uh, I'd also say history is uh, uh, should not be brought into current politics. I think a mistake that's made often is to say, You know, that is a mistake. We should organize our society according to the constitution and its values and not stoke ancient historical wounds. That is a, a recipe for more conflict, more violence, more uncertainty. And uh, it'll, it, it, it'll, so treat history as a branch of knowledge. Don't bring it into current politics. So, uh, but you just mentioned the 500 year thing. Uh, I just uh, remembered that two weeks ago, the Ministry of Culture uh, was saying that India's culture of 12,000 till 12,000 years back, we would like to research that. I mean, it's just nonsense. And if you saw, I was one the first to tweet about the members of the committee. They're all males, they're all upper caste, they're all Hindus, they're all from North India, more or less. Now, uh, I mean, it is. A, I mean, it is nonsensical. It's absolutely nonsensical, and rightly it has been criticized. And hopefully, and the only saving grace is nobody reads a government report anyway. You know, so that even if they do a report, koi nahi padega. So, uh, lastly, uh, I would like you to give a message to all the UPSC aspirants because everybody reads your book uh, for modern Indian history, uh, post-independence history, and I have been teaching it since many years to the students. And uh, this is more like a fanboy moment for me as well. But I would sincerely like you to, uh, you know, request the new crop of bureaucrats that is going to be in the country that they are going to govern the country for, let's say, 20, 30 years. They're going to uh, be in the bureaucracy. Any advice for them? How to approach? You know, my, my, I don't give advice. I don't give career advice. Period. You know, to anyone. You know, I not even to my own children. You know, I never do it. Right. All I would say is the only career advice I would give any professional, not just a potential civil servant but a potential engineer, an entrepreneur, a lawyer, a doctor, a journalist, a musician is cultivate some interests outside your job. And above all, uh, the three great contributions of human civilization are literature, art and music. You know, so cultivate an interest in literature, art and music and the joy you will get. You may not be able to cultivate interest in all three. 
If you have a good ear, cultivate a deeper interest in our classical music. If you like reading books, read novels set in different parts of the world. If you appreciate art, start taking photographs, collecting photographs, go to galleries and study the paintings of uh, uh, great uh, artists of the past. So what an interest in culture in the broadest sense, art, literature, and music can do. It can make you much more human. You know, what I do, it's now 5.40 uh, as we are recording. Every day I work, I stop working at 5.30. I then read a novel for an hour and then I, read, and then I put on the light before dinner and I listen to Indian classical music. You know, I have a very large collection and now YouTube gives you much more. And I just listen to music. And what music has done to me, of course, I've been reading fiction from when I was very young. It just gives me much more pleasure and solace and consolation. So all I've all the only career advice I would give to anyone in any profession is cultivate an interest in something outside your work. It does not have to be art or music or literature. It could be nature. You could be interested in plants or birds or, or you know, uh, or sculpture. I mean, the joy you'll get out of that. Uh, and spend less time on your smartphone and less time watching television. Get out into the field and experience once the pandemic ends. Get out into the field and experience this country, this world for yourself. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sure that uh, this advice would be heeded by most of the bureaucrats uh, that are in the making. Thank you once again for your time and uh, agreeing to this. We wish you all the best of uh, health. And with that, we would like to end this session. Thank you everyone, everyone for watching this.